So you probably remember that earlier in the week, I made a claim that the Cybertruck and the Model 3 Plus were cannibalizing the Model Y. And many of you, like me, you know, we might want a Tesla, and we might have a small or even a main preference for the crossover SUV. We like the look or the storage capacity, but we might be buying or waiting for the Cybertruck, or maybe we're buying or waiting for a Model 3 Plus or the Model 3 Ludicrous because of the prestige, or maybe because we're an early adopter, maybe because it's a lifestyle purchase and we want to look cool, or maybe it's the technology, or maybe the performance of these new vehicles is really, really enticing, or special attributes like the quietness and the smooth ride, the stereo, and all that kind of stuff, which isn't in the Model Y as it's presently configured. Well, many people said, no way, that's not happening. So I decided to take a poll. Now, obviously, it's not a scientific poll, and we only got, I think, 70-something votes or whatever. But I thought, what the heck? So I said, if you are a serious Cybertruck buyer, you're really going to buy one, or you already have bought one. And um, would you please let me know, was this your first truck purchase ever? And if it was your first truck purchase ever, are you normally someone who would buy the SUV range? Or are you somebody who would buy a sedan? Well, it or, or you know, or maybe you have bought trucks in the past. Well, it turns out that the um, forty five percent said they had never ever owned a truck before. They had only owned SUVs or sedans in the past. Fifty five percent said that they had owned a truck. I rest my case. This means that Tesla can sell a lot more Model Ys if they update to the Juniper as soon as possible, which is what I've been saying for a couple of weeks. Anyway, my argument might be moot if these improvements in the FSD result in a major run on everything Tesla. We might get to a place where people will just be like, I need a Tesla because I want the FSD for all kinds of different reasons. And I'm not particular and I particularly particularly like the SUV. And I'll take the fact that it's not quite as cool in terms of all the tech as its cousins are. Anyway, um, that's all entirely possible. Now, it's also possible that Tesla doesn't care whether the uh, uh, the Model Y sales fall a little bit, because maybe they can easily switch over production in Fremont or add production in Austin on the Model 3. Same thing in Europe if Model 3 starts to sell a ton. Um, and the Model Y is, you know, not quite as active this year. Now, of course, both of those things would be cool. If we get the Model 3 really selling like crazy, then bring in the new, I'm sorry, getting the Model 3 Plus and, the, and Ludicrous selling really well. Then next year, when the Juniper comes in, then we can see another spurt in uh, those as well. So anyway, I don't know exactly what the, what the plan is, what the theory is, but it'll be interesting to find out. Meanwhile... Gary Black must have been paying attention to my videos or something like that because he said today, he says, I'm not sure why Tesla doesn't just buy Uber. Get into the autonomous ride hailing business and get all the data from its platform of 137 million consumers who take 25 million trips per day. Um, well, I didn't say buy, I, I, but I did say do a deal. I do think they should do a deal with Uber and maybe buying might be the better way or at least as good as doing a deal. I'm not sure which one would be the best, but Gary goes on, he says, look, Uber is the entrenched leader in ride hailing. They have made clear that they will go autonomous when the tech is ready. Tesla can't just wave its magic wand and replace them. Building ride hailing from scratch would lose Tesla money for years. Look at what happened to Lyft. I don't necessarily buy that it would lose them money for years because I think they're pretty clever especially in things like AI and whatnot, but we'll get back to that in a second. So then farsiness answers Gary Black. He says, I don't follow this. Ride hailing is 100% software using an app. Tesla already has the app. They already build the cars, put the cars on the app, offer rides cheaper than Uber Lyft, and then cook them. And, and Farsi says, what am I missing? Well, Gary Black responds to that. He says, you guys are naive. Teslas don't just drive themselves. And Uber is a well-established brand with 6 million drivers and valued network to whom customers are very loyal. Just putting out a Tesla ride-hailing app with the Tesla brand name on it 
won't get Tesla 25 million rides a day. No, but it might get them 5 million rides a day or a million rides a day, and then 2 million, and then 3 million. I think Gary and Farzad are completely missing the point. While Tesla has amazing capabilities regarding apps, AI for figuring out the logistics, et cetera, the knowledge that they could gain from buying or even the strategic advantage of a, advantages of a partnership would move them more immediately and seamlessly. Let that word sink in immediately and seamlessly into the ride hailing business. Now, the main benefit of a partnership is that Uber is the main benefit of doing a partnership rather than a purchase is that Uber currently has a market value of 160 billion. Uh, and you're going to have to pay a premium on top of that to buy them out. The stock will also run up as soon as there's evidence that Tesla's think about buying them. So could Tesla get as much knowledge? and structure, even though fewer customers and revenue if they bought Lyft, which is only worth $7 billion. Hmm, that's another possibility. Uh, again, I'm going, to, I'm going to come to my same conclusion as I came to before, and that is you do a deal with Uber. Maybe you buy them, but you probably do a deal with Uber. You have all of the Tesla owners in the Uber range already, the folks that are either leasing uh, 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 getting a, getting their Uber from um, Hertz or, or have, you know, purchased a, an, a Tesla vehicle. They're already driving in the Uber range, in the Uber uh, network. So those guys would be immediately ready to go. They would be able to potentially stay as supervised drivers for a while while things are being worked out with regula regulatory agencies, insurance companies, et cetera, and then slowly but surely move them out of the automobiles. Those same individuals might choose to buy a second car or a third car, lease a second car, a third car, uh, and then they can be sitting at home while their cars are making money for them. They get the business. They've already been doing it for a while, so they would understand it better than anybody. Well, almost anybody. <laughs> so then, then um, at the same time, people like you and me that own a Tesla vehicle, but have not been doing any Uber drives, we could choose to join the Uber platform also when it's time. Either we want to go out and have those conversations with riders right now. Wouldn't be any fun for me. I love talking, but not that way. Anyway, or maybe uh, just wait until it actually comes to a place where you can be a, uh, you know, just put your car out and uh, let it uh, drive itself to its next destination. Anyway, uh, those are my thoughts. I think that would be a really, really smart way to do it. But I think Tesla might choose to do it from the ground up and I'm sure they'll do a fine job. Anyway, um, this is Randy Kirk. In case uh, you've forgotten, you know, this is where you hit the like button. And look, I'm going to admit, I don't always hit the like button, even when I like them. So if you like it, if you thought that was any good, if you thought that I was, you know, it was even, you know, decent. As people say that I have a radio voice and that uh, it's a nice, husky, soft radio voice. And, and it's really good for going to sleep. So maybe you could use my videos to, you know, for nap time. It could help you to, you know, get a good night's sleep or a good afternoon sleep. Uh, if that's a good reason, hit the like button. I don't particularly care which reason. I'm almost to 21,000 subscribers. I think I'm a 15 short or something. So maybe you could be the number 21,000th, 21,000th person to subscribe. Uh, that'd be great too. And then, uh, of course, there's always uh, hitting up uh, Notify because we've got great stuff coming tomorrow. We've got CERN Basher around 12. Oh yeah, Larry and I in the morning talking about Kathy Wood's you know, monthly report. You don't want to miss that one. So hit notify. Then Sir Basher, he's got an amazing set of slides coming up on, guess what? FSD. Yeah, very interesting stuff. Stuff nobody else has talked about yet. Unless you're on X, you might've seen him talking about it on X, but he, we're going to get into it way deeper than you can in that environment. And then uh, in the afternoon, of course, later at, late, late afternoon, uh, California time, you've got my regular Monday morning show on Sunday night, where we talk about all of the stuff that's coming up next week. You know what's coming up next week? CPI. Oh, my. <laughs> and then maybe you want to join Patreon. Uh, that'd be great, too. Love to have more folks helping to support the channel. Anyway, Elon said today that Starship 4 will attempt a faux landing. He didn't say that. He didn't use the word faux. I forget what word he used. But anyway, they're going to attempt a landing probably in the ocean. So another, or, you know, I think that's what they're talking about. It'll be kind of like a landing, but it will still be uh, the end of that particular Starship. 
Uh, I don't know. He didn't say whether he was going to try to land the Starship and also the booster. Not sure about that. The booster is supposed to be easier um, and then Starship a lot harder. But he did say Starship 4, they're going to attempt a landing. And if successful, they will go for a launch pad landing with the chopsticks on number five. That's so exciting. I can hardly think about it. I just can't wait to see that thing. <laughs> Have those chopsticks come and catch that vehicle. Anyway, that's a little faster than I kind of expected, but I was hoping it would be this year. Trueflation today is at 1.82%. As we go to those CPI readings later this week, and I was like, okay, trueflation, I've got this beef with you, by the way, they changed the date. I'm not going to be on on the 9th. I'm going to be on on the 16th. I've got my list ready to go of things I think they should change, fix, uh, what I think they're, what, what, why I think I've lost confidence, but I continue to report them. Um, and they're saying 1.82 CPI, PPI, PCE, everything is saying it's really closer to three. So they're way, way under those numbers. Anyway, here is the things that I found going through the details. The food away from home has come down from its highs, but it is still the number one thing leading the pack as far as inflation is concerned, sitting at 4% over last year, which was already all the way, hugely up. But, you know, these people are getting nailed by the labor issue. And so they're still 4% up over last year. Own residential coming down a bit, but still way over 2%. Closer to 4%. I think actually it was also right in the 4% range. Tobacco coming down, but still a little bit over 2%. And then here's the ones that are down and not over 2%. You've got consumer durables down sharply. You've got uh, way down. You've got tobacco coming down a little bit over 2%. Clothing and footwear down sharply. Communications going up a little bit, but still under 0%. You've got education falling sharply, almost down to 2%, very close to 2%. Recreation and culture also falling sharply and just under 2%. Personal care, which was way up there around 5, 6, 7, is now down sharply, but it's still around 3%. And then auto purchase price, auto purchasing price down sharply under zero by a bit. You also have, of course, gasoline that has come way back up, but it's still under zero. Okay, so uh, personal residences, the owned personal homes, food away from home, personal care. Those are the only three categories that are still well above 2%. Interesting. So kind of what they're showing is that their 1.8% is pretty much the whole basket. It isn't like one basket's still really out of control and other baskets are, are really, really down. I mean, there's some divergence between 4% and negative two. There's no doubt about that, but it's way more closely tied in altogether at this point. Okay, this is from Business Insider. And what a difference a weekend makes. <laughs> from seven to three, and now potentially zero, those are the number of projected interest rate cuts in 2024, if you ask the Wall Street analyst. Just a few months ago, evidence of fast-falling inflation suggested that the Federal Reserve would get aggressive in normalizing interest rates this year, with initial market projections suggesting the Fed would lower the effective Fed fund rates to 3.5 by the end of this year from its current level of 5.25. I can remember Gary Black being very clear that we would be down to 3.5 on the Fed, on the treasuries at least. But a series of strikes, by the way. <laughs> If you're going to go out every single day and make predictions and projections like I do, then you're going to be wrong a lot, okay? I take my hits. I'm wrong a lot. I'm hoping that my analysis is good, and then I'm right from time to time. And I think I'm right about that whole business up there about the uh, Model Ys being cannibalized. Anyway, but a series of strong economic data over the past few weeks, flanked by solid job reports, a pickup in manufacturing activity, and a strong first quarter GDP forecast of 2.5 from the Atlanta Fed, suggests that investors will have to wait a bit longer for lower interest rates. Falling interest rates are a tailwind for stock prices as they lower the discount rate that is often used to value stocks. We talk a lot about that on this channel, including Tesla. They're hard hit by that, that particular vector, leading to higher value multiples. So a delay in interest rate cuts on paper would suggest lower stock prices overall. But 
What ultimately drives stock prices in the long term is earnings growth and better than expected first quarter profits have helped put a floor on a stock market that is trading near record highs, even as the talks of interest rates cuts falter or fade. Well, they go on, rosy growth outlooks are driven by an economy at full employment and efficiency gains driven by the growing adoption of artificial intelligence suggest the stock prices could continue to rise even if interest rates stay elevated. This is according to billionaire investor Ken Fisher. You've heard of him. And if the stock market and the economy do withstand higher interest rates for longer, it will give the Federal Reserve more ammunition to significantly cut interest rates in a bid to stimulate the economy whenever the next inevitable recession arrives. Ultimately, good news in the economy appears to be good news in the stock market for as long as a recession is averted. So multiple things could cause the Fed to move between now and the end of the year. Some people are recommending or suggesting that if they don't move in June, then they won't move at all this year because it's getting too close to the election and could be looking like they are interfering with the election. Um, other folks are saying that the only that they might not raise, they'll want to raise once this year, but they might wait till November when the election is over. Um, I think there's two things that could really trigger. One would be a dramatic change in those employment numbers. And the other would be that the CPI begins to reflect those lower rentals because that's like 30 something percent of the CPI number, if those lower rentals start to show up in the numbers, and that could happen this week or next month, which would be way before June, uh, you could see that the, the Fed could say, okay, now we've seen the numbers we've been looking to see, and we will begin to cut the rates. Uh, and, and it doesn't have to be 2%. It could, the, the, uh, the core could come in at, uh, you know, 2.5, uh, 2.4, something like that. Now, I'm pretty sure they would start to cut. All right, that's just my thinking right now. So it turns out a stunning seven in 10 Americans, this is according to Yahoo Finance. This is interesting. This is this goes against some of the other stuff that we're hearing, although, okay. A stunning seven in 10 Americans have cut their contributions to their retirement savings account due to the rising cost of living, according to the 2024 first quarter study from Allianz, I don't know, Alliance, Alliance, life insurance company. Spill, it's funny. Anyway, about two and three are worried about paying bills. They're more worried about paying their bills than saving for retirement. So a lot of these people had kind of begun to put into the retirement, retirement plans during the pandemic and all the extra money that came in. <laughs> I got a letter the other day from the state of California. I somehow never took my 750 that I was supposed to get a year ago. So that was a nice surprise. <laughs> anyway, so there's still money coming into the system from the pandemic. Another troubling finding was that more than two in five Americans say they've dipped into their retirement savings because of rising inflation. Let me know in the comments below, have you dipped into your retirement savings or have you stopped putting into your retirement savings? It'd be interesting to hear from this crowd. What we're seeing is that many Americans have used stop gap measures to make ends meet recently, according to Kelly Levin, Vice President of Consumer Insights at Alliance. She, she told uh, Yahoo Finance, while some may have been able to withstand inflation at the beginning, the prolonged increases in prices, especially on essentials like food and energy, in particular gasoline right now, without an equal increase in wages, has hit many people's breaking point. So these would be the kinds of things that we're talking about for the last few days. On the one hand, I have gone completely back. I'm saying there's no recession this year. I, I'm saying it's we're in uh, the beginning of April now. We've got the jobs reports from March. No, we're not going to have a recession this year. Could we have a recession in the first quarter of next year? Very unusual to have a recession in a change in a, in, if the, if the uh, party in power changes. So if Trump wins, it would be very unusual to have a recession in that situation. Number two, you've got uh, these, uh, these pr productivity issues that I talk about all the time. And Kathy, when we talk tomorrow morning, she's talking a lot about productivity. And those productivity changes could really, really have a positive impact on the economy for years into the future, regardless of what other things are happening, positive and negative. They will begin to lift all boats, as Ronnie Reagan used to say. So anyway, that's I'm 100% in that camp that we're not going to have recession on the flip side of that. The consumer is going to run out of money. <laughs> I don't think there's any question about that. And that's probably going to happen in the third quarter, as Bank of America predicted all the way last year in the in the third in the beginning of the third quarter last year. 
I think they're going to run out of money in the third quarter, exactly as predicted. And that's going to have an impact. And that might mean that we have a very, very narrow, you know, we could be at zero on the GDP in the third quarter, we have up a little, down a little, and it won't affect the elections because we won't even know until after the elections are over that the third quarter was a bust or was nearly a bust. Anyway, that's all I've got. Please check out the CERN Basher video from earlier today. We took a super deep dive into the quarter one numbers. What happened with Tesla? Why did it happen? What about the 29 days of inventory? What does that really mean? Where are those cars? What kind of cars are they? He does a great job with all those slides and charts. If you didn't get checked it, if you didn't have a chance to check that out, the card, of course, will be right here. And then um, I think you'll enjoy that one. And of course, be uh, come on back tomorrow. Three shows tomorrow. Um, uh, in the morning early will be Larry and I. And then later in the day will be another CERN talking about FSD. And then finally, the Monday morning show on Sunday night. And it's been great talking to you.